the USS Soriskany. This mighty aircraft carrier was a fearsome presence in the wars of Korea and Vietnam. She hasn't served for more than 30 years. But now this 32,500 ton megastructure has one final duty, to sink and become a playground for divers as the largest artificial reef in the world. It's like putting a legend on the bottom. But this mission could be the toughest yet. The Navy built this ship to be unsinkable. Designed to stay afloat even after massive bombardment, aircraft carriers are almost impossible to sink. And no one's ever tried to turn one into a reef before. Anything can happen. To make her a safe dive site, a salvage crew is stripping out her poisons. But the clock is ticking. They want to get this thing towed over to Florida before hurricane season kicks in. Will the mighty Oriskany go quietly, or will she put up a fight? These kind of accidents kill. Can this giant floating fortress be scuttled? Ah! It's a high-stakes project to sink the unsinkable. Aircraft carriers are the largest, strongest, most impregnable ships afloat. Designed to withstand attack by air, ship, and even submarine torpedo. Docked at Corpus Christi, Texas, the decommissioned USS Oriskany is the first such vessel chosen for the US Navy's artificial reef program. A crack team of marine demolition experts will attempt to deliberately sink this giant okay? ship to form a man-made artificial reef, attracting divers and tourism. But sinking one of the largest and most complex warships in the world will test the skills of this team to breaking point when this ship was constructed decades ago, there were thousands of engineers and shipbuilders who gave their best efforts to ensure that this ship would never sink. This is not a trivial task, and it will require almost as much effort as it took to build the vessel to finally sink the vessel. The plan is to scuttle the Oriskany in 65 meters of water to form an outcropping for sponges and coral to colonize. This attracts recreational fishermen, a major boost to the local economy. But to make her an ideal site for shallow swimming divers, her highest point, the command tower, should be near the surface. That means the ship must settle upright. If she doesn't, the project will be a failure. It's January 2004. The first stage of the project is to identify toxic materials for removal from the Oriskany, so she won't poison the ocean environment. But after 30 years in storage, the Oriskany is in a decrepit state. She's full of lead-based paints, oil, aviation fuel, and asbestos. This will mean thousands of hours of scraping, torching, and pressure washing. And they haven't even inspected all the rooms yet. I've been crawling this ship hard for three months, about 10 hours a day, and uh, just do the sheer magnitude of the ship. Um, I still come across every now and then a room that I've not ever seen before. At 278 meters long and 45 meters wide, she displaces 32,500 tons. She's a huge and incredibly complex vessel, a floating city, filled with every service that 2,600 crew members need to live and fight at sea for months at a time. She has four kitchens, sleeping quarters, hospitals, machine shops, and radar installations. Everything from dental offices and barber shops to shoe repairers and cinemas. The Navy's head man on site is project manager Don Herring. He's got the mammoth task of ensuring every single part of the ship is inspected and cleaned. To meet strict environmental standards, he has to literally crawl through thousands of rooms and 565 tanks looking for toxic waste. Some areas are as large as an aircraft hangar, others as small as a coffin. 
and every single one must be made spotless. But that's just half of this mammoth project. They must also work out their sink plan to safely get the ship onto the bottom of the sea, exactly in the right place and standing upright. I think the contractor put a good sink plan together. It's going to flood basically without any mechanical means. And they decide how much water she can ballast, how much uh, displacement she can take on, how the water has to move, where it has to move, and when it has to move. Uh, quite involved. Involved is an understatement. Aircraft carriers are built to be unsinkable. Since World War II, no US Navy carriers have been sunk by enemy action. That's because they have four-inch armor plates surrounding an inner core of over a thousand rooms, each one capable of being shut off to prevent further flooding. To sink the Oriskany, each of these thousands of watertight spaces have to be breached. And even in her present state, the mighty O will put up a brave fight. The USS Oriskany is being prepared to be sunk, to become the largest artificial reef in the world. The project is now in full flow. Anything that can be salvaged is being removed. It's a tough job. This is the uh, starboard elevator. The planes are taken up this way. But it's now a hazard. Anything over the water like this is dangerous. The safety, you can't, this whole elevator is not worth anything if one man gets hurt. That's not worth it, so we take our time and do it correctly. It's interesting, the Navy built this ship to be unsinkable, so it's going to take a great job engineering to have it sink properly. The construction of the USS Oriskany began in May 1944. She was supposed to become the most modern ship fighting the war in the Pacific. But before the Oriskany could fire a shot in anger, the war was over. USS Oriskany, 27,000 ton Essex class aircraft carrier, awaits launching at the New York Navy Yard. She is the first United States capital ship completed since war's end. At that time, she was only able to launch and land propeller driven aircraft. And her role in the peacetime fleet was uncertain. She was later refitted to launch jet fighters with more powerful hydraulics, steering system, bridge, and flight deck, and became a strategic player in the wars of Korea and Vietnam. Right through to the 1970s, the Oriskany, or Mighty O, was one of the busiest ships in the US fleet. The Oriskany's journey from warship to reef began in September 1976 when she was decommissioned. In 1989, she was finally struck off the naval registry and then joined a large number of US warships left to rot in storage. After two failed attempts to sell this monstrous vessel for scrap, the Navy chose her for an artificial reef program. This is the first time an aircraft carrier has been sunk to form an artificial reef. It's a daunting project. Everything about this ship is vast, even the mooring lines that secure her to the dock. On the end, gigantic anchors weighing in at a whopping 15,000 kilograms each. It's a nice little anchor, and this is only the flukes. So the anchor goes down probably another five feet. So it's pretty big. Now I gotta try and get out of here. Definitely was easier going down. Frank Leckie is an expert on ship demolition, but he's never dealt with anything this big. And to make life more difficult, he's trying to complete the work before the June hurricane season blows in. There's so much to do in so short a time. Every aspect of this job is a huge challenge, even down to the lead-based paint. All of it must be removed, and there's a lot more than they expected. We were tasked with 29 tons. Halfway through, we got 29 tons, and we we're only halfway finished. 
we ended up saying, okay, we'll just fill up 24 dumpsters. We ended up filling 50 dumpsters. It's not just lead-based paint that's poisonous to the marine environment. Any liquid hydrocarbons, like oil, must also be removed. The worst of this kind of waste is in the vast engine rooms and hundreds of storage tanks, but they're not easy to get to. We develop, we call mine shafts, that go all the way down to the main engine rooms, but we had to cut through two-inch armor plating, class A armor plating here. And then on level four, just before the engine room down here, if you can look all the way down, we had to cut through armor plating again. The only thing that can remove this decades-old grime is a very high-pressure water gun. Peeling away the filth with over 8,500 pounds of force is a dangerous job. It's all about stance. You gotta stand right. You don't stand right, you'll slip, you'll fall, crack your skull open. It's pretty dangerous down there. Some of the storage tanks they have to clean are only accessible by narrow ladders descending 18 meters straight down. Not only are they operating in tight spaces, they have to contend with extreme heat. At a scorching 43 degrees Celsius, everything is difficult. What you can notice where you enter the tank is it's not only extremely hot, there's no airflow whatsoever. Okay. It's uh, somewhat oily, and it's approximately uh, oh, 50, 60 feet deep, and one has to go down a, a real narrow ladder to get there. So it's all in all an extremely strenuous job uh, that requires frequent rotation of people because of the arduous conditions. But there is a reward for all this risk. The metals that the ship was made from are now being mined to pay for the operation. These are very high-grade metals. The Navy only used the best metals when they made a ship. So there's a lot of revenue coming back out of the, each of these loads. And we ship two to three loads of this a week. But the main reason for metal recovery is several. Fourth, one is the income, and the other is that putting the metals back into brass, copper, and aluminum back into the economy, it saves energy and resources. Every time you make a new ton of copper, it takes tremendous natural resources. And to have it sit in the bottom of the ocean is not helping the reef. This is our gold mine. This is where we mine our gold. This is where we're pulling out. Gold. Copper gold. While the inside of the vessel is stripped and cleaned, outside, Navy divers are inspecting the hull. They're checking the condition of patches called blanking plates that have been welded to the underside of the ship. This will give them extra information to help strategically place the bombs that will sink the Oriskany. So our job here is to identify uh, dimensions and conditions of all the blanking plates on the openings of the sea of the risk. There are 124 on the drawing, and we have to go down and identify the condition of each one to make sure the next crew knows what they need to do. When you're working underneath the ship, you can identify the patches and the patch numbers and correct the drawings. The drawings then on the inside of the ship will identify which pipes go into that patch. So when you want to uh, sink the ship and sink it level and sink it even, you have to calculate how much water is going to come through each pipe. And if that's not done right, the ship will not sink correctly and it'll probably lay on its side or something strange like that. They want to sit it down on the bottom, sitting vertically up, just like you see it sitting here pier side, except it'll be underwater. Did you see patch 111 yet? No, we have not seen any patches yet. Both divers are a little bit too far out. You need to swim forward to the ship. The divers are working in near zero visibility. This makes the job not only difficult, but dangerous. Well, the worst thing that can happen is uh, either a diver to lose his air or lose his mask and then panic and come to the surface. If you do that and you hold your breath, the compressed air in your lungs explodes basically out of your lungs and goes in your, gets in your bloodstream, goes through your heart and goes to your brain. And that's, uh, that's called an arterial gas embolism and can result in paralysis, death, 
Uh, pretty, pretty bad stuff. Topside Red Diver, I got the pass. We're on one, one, one. Who you are? That's the one. Okay, green. Okay, green. Okay, stand by. Okay, stand by. Okay, red. Okay, red. We got an unconscious diver on the surface. Tender slid the hand. But on this kind of job, disaster can strike at any time. So these divers make sure they're prepared for the worst with regular training exercises. We got vitals. We got vitals. We got breathing. We got good bones. Eyes open. You okay? okay. Coming around. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. You with us? Yeah. Hey, what happened? What happened? All right. Today it was an exercise, but this is the kind of close call they train for all the time. Up on deck, bomb squad leader Stuart Sachs is planning the sinking. His team will be working in these huge chambers. They contain giant valves called sea chests, which open directly to the ocean, allowing water to enter the ballast chambers. Blowing these valves apart is how they'll flood the ship. We blow in this sea chest here and that sea chest there. We've identified 22 positions and valves throughout the ship. Most of them are in the center. Those are our primary. There's also some critical locations, both fore and aft. To make sure the ship sinks level, bombs must be strategically placed at structural weak points in the hull, and complete detonation is vital. If the charges are in the wrong place or use an incorrect amount of explosives, the ship could flood unevenly. This would cause her to roll and sink on her side, a disaster for the project. Everything will detonate simultaneously, and the ship should settle on an even keel. We're using a double redundant system to ensure that all charges detonate together. Uh, we don't want to have any charges not detonate, because we don't have any unexploded demolition material left in the ship. This won't be the first time the Mighty O has felt the devastating impact of explosives. During the Vietnam War, on October the 27th, 1966, a signal flare accidentally ignited a chain reaction of explosions in the Oriskany's forward hangar bay. Ron Minnick was one of the first on the scene. And when we went in there, the fire was going up the side of the building. We went to turn on the hoses on the side of the um, magazine. And when we somebody hit it with water with the other hose, the magnesium explodes when you hit it. And it just went like it was raining fire. Entombed by armor plating, the men inside never stood a chance. Fire is the most dangerous. Most of the people that died on that fire died from suffocation. They didn't die from burns. Well, they got burned after they suffocated. It was the worst disaster in the Oriskany's history. 44 pilots and crewmen lost their lives. They've been working for three months, and with the hurricane season approaching, the team raced to complete the preparations. But there's a problem. After being chosen to have the Oriskany sunk in their waters, the state of Florida has sent an environmental protection team to assess the ship. The news is not good. But it looks like they want to make the thing a little more diver safe, diver friendly. And bundles of cables such as this that are hanging down, these are the potential uh, All right. entanglement items that we'd like to remove. Um, as well as something like this, I'll go ahead and spray this. Everything that's green has got to go. So they parked out some overhead obstructions and stuff like that. We're, we're running into a little bit of a problem time-wise. We're approaching hurricane season. So we need to either 
hurry up and get it done um, if they want to get this thing towed over to Florida before hurricane season kicks in. But it's not just about keeping divers safe. The whole marine environment must be protected. And Florida State wants any polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, to be removed. All of these have to come out. These are, these are called cable trunks, mostly communication cables. We can't use torches because the cables contain PCBs. As soon as you heat them and put flame to them, it will release them into the air. And then we have a problem. So we don't torch any of them. Everything's done manually with the sawzall or with the cable cutter. We did a calculation, counted wires, length of the island, etc., how many levels, and we estimate that there was probably close to 200 miles of cable in this superstructure alone. A lot more aggravation, but it's what you got to do to get it out right. All of this extra work means that the team missed their June deadline for beating the hurricane season. December 2004. The Oriskany is at last ready to be towed to Pensacola, Florida. The anchors that were buried months earlier have to be dug up and loaded onto the flight deck, along with hundreds of meters of chain. They'll be used to hold the Oriskany in place before she's sunk. She'll be towed just over 600 miles from Corpus Christi, Texas, to Pensacola, Florida. That's where the most dangerous phase of the operation will take place. Rigging the bombs that will drop the mighty O to the sea floor. Tonight and tomorrow morning, we have the tugs coming in that are going to pull it out. Monday morning, we'll hook up all the tugs. We'll start heading out the channel. But with no engines, the Oriskany is dead in the water and totally dependent on the tugs towing her. So wind speed is critical. If it blows hard, it'll be too dangerous to leave port, and the forecast is not good. For the ship, it's so tall out of the water. If it's windy, I can't leave. So a lot of it depends on the wind. So I'm going to have all the tugs, all the people, everyone. And if it blows more than 15 miles an hour, I have to start all over again on Tuesday morning. And if it blows again, I got to start all over again on Wednesday morning. The next day, the weather situation is even worse. Well, as you can see today, it's not a good day to go. Today, we've got probably 20 knot winds. We can't leave until it's 10, at least 10 knot winds is the maximum. With all this wind, it's for sure canceled. With all crews on standby, the costs are mounting. It can cost up to $100,000 a day. You have the pilots, the assist tugs, Put some gas in your car, look at the prices today. I've got 10,000 horsepower tugboats. For one day, that will burn 7,000 gallons. It's $30,000 in fuel. The team must be ready to go as soon as the weather improves. Guys, in the morning, we're all gonna come in at six o'clock. It may be good weather, it may not be good weather, but in the following morning, we're gonna do the same thing until the ship leaves. She's battled foreign enemies and high seas. Now, for the first time in her life, the mighty Oriskany must wait for good weather. In Corpus Christi, Texas, the USS Oriskany is waiting to be towed to her final resting place. The project has been delayed for days by bad weather, but now the forecast is finally good. It's not been an official go yet, but if I had to bet my paycheck on it, we're out of here. <laughs> I'm glad she's leaving. I think we've done everything that we was asked to do. It's time for it to be over. Uh, and I think that we certainly accomplished everything we came here to do. Word comes down, and the job of moving this massive hulk begins. Roger, Roger, they're going to go ahead and cut that cable free. Make sure everybody's down and clear. Well, since the dolphin tug is free, I'll just go ahead and cut this one and we're done. Uh, he's done now. Cut everything right now. They're almost on their way. But after removing thousands of tons of precious metals and waste, 
The ship is sitting very high in the water. This makes getting under the bridges in the channel a tall order. The toughest one to get under is this lift bridge right here. I mean, we cleared it coming in, but it was real tight, like six or eight inches. And then we're headed straight back out to the bay and hang a left. There's hardly any room to spare. They have to time the tide precisely. They had a guy up there with a sawzall ready to go. <laughs> the team has pumped in tons of ballast water to lower the ship. Now they'll find out whether their calculations are correct. I'll be going about three knots. I'd rather go if it's going slower. The danger is if it's going fast and it hits something, it's going to damage a lot. If it's going slow, it can touch it. It's a huge gamble. Wow. The tugs aim for the center of the bridge. If the tide is too high, the mighty O will rip it down. It's close, but she just makes it. The Ariscone is on her way. She's done. All right. The next challenge is to make it to Pensacola, just over 600 miles away. But as the Ariscone reaches the bay, the unthinkable happens. One of the tow lines has broken loose. The ship's drifting dangerously close to the rocky shore, and the crew frantically try to work out a plan. The 30-ton chain thrashes the tugs. As she drifts without power, the Oriskany is in a perilous situation. Repeated attempts to fix the tow line fail. But finally, the crew succeed in reconnecting it to the tug. After a very close call, they can finally complete the journey to Florida. The Oriskany is docked at last, but now the project is delayed again. The Navy must prove to the authorities that the ship is totally safe to be sunk. And this process takes an incredible 14 months. Finally, in February 2006, they get the green light and can begin the last preparations for scuttling the ship. The naval engineers have developed a plan that they believe will sink the ship evenly and quickly. Holes are strategically cut through dozens of tanks and chambers. The Oriskany was built not to sink because of her side protection system, and she's got tanks on either side of her forward to aft. Uh, if it took a hit in the first tank, you had two more tanks inside to keep it watertight. Or maybe it would penetrate two tanks. You still had one more to keep it watertight. So in the sink plan, what they had us do was fill all of these tanks so they're already full of water. So now all of this protection system is now full of water. We flood around it. Uh, that's why the unsinkable ship is now sinkable. It's all about completely flooding the vessel. The double-layered hull, side protection tanks and thick steel walls must be cut in a precise way to allow seawater to fill the ship evenly and quickly. Once we get out to the sink site, uh, Frank will have some of his people come down in the space and they'll remove all of these patches. Too much water in one side or the other, and the ship will roll over. Our major deal has been trying to pump the ship down, putting all the ballast in it. And we put approximately uh, 15,000 tons of water, which is about 540 tanks that we've filled. But there's a hitch. 
The ancient ship is leaking like a sieve. Water's getting into places it shouldn't. In particular, the dry tanks where the 22 bombs will be placed. And water and explosives don't mix. We have engine spaces that we need uh, to put explosive charges in. With an old ship like this, the tanks are leaking through the pipes. So a lot of the water is going into the engine room spaces. We have to pump that out before the explosives go on board. So we need to keep these spaces real dry. With the ship drying out, the bomb squad can move in. Laying the detonation cord, or det cord, through this maze of corridors is a treacherous job. Aircraft carriers are, you know, the biggest ships we got. If you think you can go one way, you know, you think you're going starboard, and then all of a sudden you get turned around and you're going port. It takes 10 miles of detonation cord to connect the 22 bombs to the control panel. Yeah, sometimes. Some... The most important thing for us with dead cord is uh, the route. We want to make sure that uh, we don't kink it or cross over other charges or other dead cords. The detonation cords all lead to one place, this boat on the flight deck. It's here that the electronics that control the ignition of the bombs will be housed. The 45-foot boat is strapped down to the deck, but will release and float away while the aircraft carrier sinks beneath it. This actually turns on the firing system, fires the firing system, and also functions the cable cutters that cut this whole vessel away from the ship as it sinks. There's a duplicate over on the support vessel. Basically what we have is a brake wire around each charge, and as each charge detonates, we'll get an indication here. We record it down here instantaneously, and then it's transmitted back to the support vessel for verification. Today, the number one thing is safety. We've got this entire ship rigged with explosives and with military debt cord. That's the stuff right here. Kind of green, kind of smooth. Nobody goes below the hangar deck without an escort because we have all of our charges in place and they're all attached to their debt cords. The worst could, could happen would be an uncommanded detonation. If you happen to disturb it, Pull it, snag it, just let me know, and we'll, we'll take a look at it. I cannot stress it enough. You know, we do not want to have an accident, and these kind of accidents kill. The stakes are high. Alongside the bomb squad, workers rush to complete any last-minute cleanups. An uneasy situation. One step in the wrong place could trigger the explosives. The ship would sink at the dock, and lives could be lost. Yeah. The closer we get to the end here, probably the more dangerous it gets because now we're opening every access that we created for the, for the sink. So there's holes everywhere. There's every hatch is removed. Uh, there's holes in the deck, holes in the bulkhead. Uh, deck plates are gone, uh, which is all planned and supposed to be that way, but it gets hazardous. Gutted clean and wired to blow, there's only one thing left to do. Yeah, let's go sink an aircraft carrier. Loaded with explosives, the mighty O is cut loose from her moorings. The Oriskany leaves port for the very last time. Yeah, we're good. Come on, guys, put the compass up. The demolition team stay on board. They'll monitor any holes covered by temporary steel patches and are ready to man the pumps if the ship starts to take on water. It's an old ship, and, and look at her. After all the gutting we've done, she's still tough. Uh. An armada of tugs takes up position in case the aircraft carrier breaks free from her tow lines. The countdown to zero hour has begun. Now, 25 miles offshore, 
the Oriskan Inn is her final resting place in the Gulf of Mexico. NES uh, Harbor Security, this is Alpha Tango. How copy over? This is Harbor Security, reach a loud clear over. Just want to re clarify, we need a 1250 foot arc from any point on the Oriskany today. Uh, Roger, sir, we'll maintain a 1250. Harbor Security, MI 74. Uh, Roger. Under agreement with the state of Florida, the aircraft carrier must be sunk upright and on a very precise set of coordinates. The tugboats carefully maneuver the mighty O to a buoy that marks the spot. How far away are we, Robert? 150 feet forward, forward. Ranger, we're about 350 feet off. Hey, when it gets close, Frank, give that uh, tugboat here a hard port. And I'll swing the bow over there and get right where you want. To make sure the ship stays precisely over the target, the four massive anchors will be deployed. This is the starboard anchor chain, which is connected up above to the island. From here, we're going to have approximately 100 tons of chain and anchor that's going to hold the ship offshore. Roger, Roger. And this will be the first and most major chain and anchor that we're going to deploy. The ship's anchor was normally three inch chain. We brought three and three eighths chain. And the original ship's anchors were like 25,000 pounds. We brought 30,000 pounds to keep the ship in one place. We only have one time deployment. Once we cut our cable, we cannot retrieve it. We cannot bring it in. We cannot shorten it. We cannot lengthen it. We have one shot, and this is the only shot that we have to deploy nearly 100 tons of chain per leg of anchor. We're on site. Okay, we're cut it. They're exactly in position. Flash the anchor. Flash the anchor. Anchor's gone. anchors in the water. To ensure the ship floods evenly, there are still a few last holes to be cut. Once these sections of the hull are opened up, there's nothing to stop her from sinking. We cut the six by six holes on the side of the ship so that when it comes down to that level, the water will flow in and make the ship sink fast. We got it. That's you guys' job. We're we got her. Stand She's relieved. Got it. Go blow it up. Tomorrow, after her very last night at sea, the Oriskany goes to the bottom. Next morning, and as the countdown approaches, the demolition team hurriedly move out. This is the sink day we're doing it. We're cleared off the rest of our equipment and then get ourselves off. So they, when they arm the explosives, we're crazy, but we're not that crazy to stay here. The final job on board is to mount video cameras to capture the explosions. To film the Oriskany sinking from inside the ship, cameras are mounted on the hangar deck. It's been pretty smooth since we've been out here and I expect it's going to remain that way. Uh, the weather looks good, but anything can happen, you know, anything can happen. Final systems are checked and rechecked before the green light to start the countdown is lit. Security is tight and all ships are kept outside a one mile exclusion zone. Oh my God, it's all the, way out here. the bomb squad rolls out the final lines of detonation cord. The charges are set. The Oriskany is once again armed and dangerous. After years of planning and preparation, 
The USS Oriskany is seconds from becoming the largest artificial reef in the world. Tell you, copy. Hey, Troy. The charges have blown successfully, but will the mighty O sink straight and level as planned, or will she go down fighting? This is really, really strange. Strange? <laughs> oh, yeah, to see her do this. I mean, just uh, eerie. She's taking on a lot of water right now, a lot of water. It appears that she's uh, just about to the third deck right now. But there's a problem. The ship is leaning to one side. You're seeing the whole of the flight deck. What's going to happen is the house is going to help to start writing it once it goes down. The only problem is right now it's this a bit too much. I could roll on her side. baby girl, do what she's supposed to do. She'll level out, she'll level out. She's gonna do it her way. Come on baby, roll back over again. Roll back over. Level it up. In this spectacular footage from the hangar deck camera, a wall of water engulfs the ship. Only 37 minutes after detonation, the mighty O succumbs to the sea and slips beneath the waves. She's starting to right herself. It's coming back around again. Boom, it's going to hit the bottom. There she goes, yeah! All right, get her down. Well done, well done, son. The cheers are premature. For the job to be successful, Oriskany must be sitting upright on the seabed. And the only way to find out for sure is to dive on the site and inspect the ship. She's sitting upright in 65 meters of water and perfectly positioned. The mission is a success. From her launch at the end of World War II, she's given over 30 years of valiant service, surviving Korea and Vietnam. Now the USS Oriskany can finally lay at rest. She was once one of the deadliest killers afloat. Now this huge piece of military hardware will become home to a vast array of sponges and coral, providing a playground for thousands of divers. Even at the end of her career, the Oriskany is still serving. This time, as the largest artificial reef in the world. A noble end for a mighty ship. And Megastructures returns next week at the same time, 8 o'clock.
Next tonight, it was supposedly based on real-life events with hauntings and poltergeist activity, but is there any truth at all in the rumours, or was it just a big old hoax?